Welcome, my name is Chris Miller. I'm president of the Piedmont Environmental Council. So thoughtful of you guys to join us. Uh, we are in the process of, of doing uh, a lot of this online briefings uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the inability to do large in-person meetings. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to come Zoom around with us. And what we're gonna try to do is update you on our work in Fauquier County and a little bit more broadly uh, within the region and at the state level in response to a whole lot of changing circumstances. Um, I've been at PEC for a while, so since 1996. Um, very proud to be head of the organization and today we've got a wonderful representation of the, the incredible staff that the, the board has put together and supports um, Mike Kane runs our land conservation program, uh, Julie Bolthouse, who's been our FOC here representative for many years, uh, new hire Matt Coyle, who's taken over the local food systems work, Claire Catlett, who does conservation work in FOC here in Rappahannock, uh, Maggie Blumstrom, who's uh, like Claire is a, a long time and original resident of FOC here, um, and they are working together on our uh, initiative in the Rappahannock Rapid Island Watershed. Uh, Tracy Lind, who, who does work in, in Fauquier, Clark, and Loudoun uh, along the Blue Ridge. Uh, all of them work together to, to represent um, you and, and our concerns in Fauquier County. So really exciting to have such a, a vibrant and talented team um, together. We're gonna cover a range of issues. Um, you know, the headings here are kind of, um, generic, local land use is a lot more interesting than it might appear. Um, uh, Julie not only covers both the Warrington Town Council and the, and the County uh, Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors, but she's very aware of issues that are uh, confronting the county more generally. Um, the apparently illegal dis disposal of, of, of dirt, she's gonna have a section on dirt, and then the challenge that we face uh, as both in Fauquier here and then more broadly across the region and the uh, increasing efforts to site large scale uh, solar installations. A lot of news in land and, and water conservation, uh, wonderful projects going forward, uh, lots of excitement from the landowner community, both about conservation and restoration work. Um, you'll hear a lot of different aspects that PC is involved in. And then an area of increasing importance, uh, longtime interest of PECs, but one where I think public visibility has never been greater is around local food systems and food security. And hopefully that'll cause you to have uh, comments and questions and we'll be able to have a good op open conversation towards the end of the, the, end of the time together. Uh, since March 12th, we've been working remotely. Um, the board and supporters of PEC have, have always been uh, big investors in the ability to use technology and work remotely. And so we were able to um, move our entire operation online um, actually well before the, the COVID-19 closures. Uh, we went home with our laptops and started to use all, all of our web-based uh, databases and everything. So, so the organization has been fully functional and, and, and working hard, but our office has, our physical offices have been closed. We've been working hard to keep our staff and board safe, but also all of our members. And that meant uh, postponing and canceling a lot of events, including having volunteers. That's changed now. We feel like we know how to manage uh, volunteers at the community farm at Roundabout Meadows carefully. And uh, so we are asking folks to help out there. There are some specific uh, volunteer projects that people can help with online. And you know we have been able to engage folks uh, directly in the field with, with enough physical and social distancing to be safe. But it certainly has had an impact on you know, sort of the day-to-day -day, uh, operations at our office. We've been doing a lot of the online programming, um, but the good news from, from our perspective is that with the support of the board and with, with a lot of uh, support from the community, we've been able to be uh, fully engaged and fully employed. And uh, we hope that that is gonna produce great results this year. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, COVID-19 has changed everything um, from workplace design and, 
and how we work as a staff, the economy that we are working in, and then more directly relevant to PEC's long-term work, how we plan and design communities and how we uh, plan and, and, and conserve open space. Um, there's a renewed debate now about housing patterns. Uh, we, we were in a long-term trend towards smart growth and, and use of compact design and, and transit as a basis for uh, the future. COVID-19 has really reopened that question and it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very difficult one to, to work through. Uh, transit agencies feel like they can provide uh, a safe uh, system, um, but their, their revenue structures and other things are dependent on levels of use that, that are a little bit higher than what is probably in their safety plan. So that's, that's raised questions about housing patterns, about transportation infrastructure. Uh, and then in addition to that, because of uh, transformational changes at the General Assembly and, and decisions by Dominion Power and other utilities, we're moving rapidly towards a renewable energy future. Uh, it's a very positive outcome from a long-term debate, but it does have challenges in, in, in terms of siting and, and location of, of some of those, those projects. Um, conservation is, is in the limelight. Uh, it's one of the few areas of bipartisan agreement in Congress. And in the last two years, we've produced a farm bill and now the Great American Outdoors Act, which has increased the level of federal support for conservation and restoration to frankly unprecedented levels. And you know, that's exciting. That gives us something to work against and work, work around, work through. Um, and we're working hard to make sure that Virginia and the Piedmont region in particular takes advantage of those new opportunities. Um, all of this is going to be influenced in two election cycles that Virginia is gonna go through in the next two years. The first being the federal elections, which will obviously have a lot at stake. Uh, but then again, in the next year with the election of a new governor um, and all of the House of Delegates, um, the, the, the ch potential for significant change in our leadership is, is very real. And that could signal a set of priorities and, and interests that are um, an evolution from where we are today. So all those things are going on. And we are trying to be prepared for them and to, to help, help you be prepared for them as we go forward. Um, we've got a short-term um, priority of focused on the General Assembly, which is having a special session next week on August 18th and may last for a week or so. They're really focused on the budget and whether they need to make budget adjustments for fiscal year 2021, which started July 1. A number of budget increases that had been approved in, in February and March were put on hold. And so I think a lot of the debate is to the degree to which they feel comfortable moving forward with increases in conservation restoration funding that they quite frankly uh, had, had, had been supportive of and uh, we hope they won't back away from. Uh, two areas of particular uh, interest are the funding for the Virginia Land Conservation Foundation, which was a grant program to support land conservation projects. And the second is agricultural best management practices, particularly livestock exclusion, riparian buffers, and nutrient management plans, all of which had a significant increase in the, in the 2021 budget amendments. So we're, um, we're prepared to go down there. We have a, um, our lobbying team has been working the last three weeks on, the, on those issues. And our goal there is to try to uh, emphasize that the amount that is spent on conservation and restoration is proportionally very, very important. Uh, the total budget is $57 billion. The conservation portion is about 200 million. So we think we, we, we should continue to keep the levels of funding that were agreed to. Um, and that, that hopefully will be the position of the governor and the legislature. We have some concerns about uh, some proposed policy changes that are, that are either coming now at the special session or maybe uh, when we come back together after the election, um, after, after the, the General Assembly reconvenes in January. There's been some real focus on the land preservation tax credit uh, with some suggestions from the Secretary of Natural Resources and other members of this, that secretariat that uh, the conservation of private land is an inequitable and uh, 
essentially, essentially tool of white supremacy. Um, that's a, a very disturbing framing of a program that has protected incredible public benefits across the, the, um, the Commonwealth, and one which has been, in fact, one of the most uh, accessible and equitable programs in the country, precisely because the tax credits are transferable, can be sold. So anybody, whether it's not related to income, uh, can take advantage of the program. And it gives landowners that are land rich but cash poor a real opportunity to participate. So both the public benefits and the, and the actual uh, inclusion that's possible under that program are potentially under scrutiny and we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, there's also a lot of concern about environmental justice and where, where the focus of, of uh, environmental protection has been over the last 20 or 30 years and, and, and that's uh, going to be an increasing area of, of attention by the, by the General Assembly. Um, so, I'm going to move here. I got stopped. Let's see. Here we go. We'll go back. So, you know, all those things are on the table. Um, just as a as a, a, a framing of PEC's priorities over the last five months, we've really been focused on food systems and food security, trying to do what we can um, to help our communities that are facing. Uh, significant changes in their income, but also in their access to food uh, as the national system of, of centralized production of almost everything has broken down in, in the COVID crisis. We've been doing a lot of work on public access uh, through investment in open space, trails, um, parks, greenways, and blueways. And you'll hear some more about that as it applies to Fauquier County. Um, clearly had challenges in terms of en enabling people to participate at the local and state level. And, you know, how, how do you comment when you can't be, be there in person or, or at least uh, you make it, how do you, how do you effectively bring your, your point of view to bear uh, in ways that are not, not what we're used to. Uh, we've been, we've found that landowners are more interested than ever in conservation and restoration. And so we've been trying to find a, a ways to service that, you know, given the restrictions that we're, we're under in terms of protecting the safety of both our, our landowners and ourselves. Um, and then we've really been confronted by the larger societal question about equity and diversity, inclusion and justice um, as it applies to Virginia, those are tough, tough questions. And we, like every organization, uh, is taking them very seriously. Um, we have formed a, a, a staff uh, task force to look at everything from our articles and incorporation right through to our programs and, and our budget priorities to make sure that we are doing what we can to be uh, adjusted in, in, in every instance. Um, the board is supportive of that, and we, we, we are looking forward to the initial reporting uh, in September. Um, we feel very connected to our communities, but, but we also understand that, that there's a history of uh, systemic problems that we have to uh, acknowledge or, that we're a part of, and we have to figure out how we can address those going forward. But after all those tough challenges are put on the table, I want to make sure you know that in the, the longer term view, uh, we have a very hopeful outlook. And that's hard to imagine in this time of, of great change and a great challenge. But everything we've seen over the last few years and continue to see now points to a community, a set of communities who care so much about where they live and the people who they live, live with uh, that they're making investments in a better and more sustainable future. Uh, this map is a cumulative map of all the conservation that's been done uh, in the in the nine county region where we work. Um, it's it's simply a piece of Virginia, but it's an important piece. Uh, it's archetypal in the sense that it ranges from very urbanizing areas around Loudoun and the metro system and Charlottesville and the city of Charlottesville, all the way to very rural areas in Madison Green, Rappahannock. Uh, Fauquier, Clark, and, and Loudoun. And so we, we work across the entire, entire spectrum of, of human settlement patterns, and we are very interested in, in all, all of them. Um, 
The, the good news is that conservation by private individuals over the last uh, 40 years has made a huge difference, almost 50 years now. And um, we are at 420,000 plus acres uh, permanently protected. That includes 2,000 miles of stream, 10,000 acres of wetlands, almost 200,000 acres of prime farmland, and, and a host of beautiful and scenic and culturally important areas. Um, all that's very important because what we're finding is that we have to be more and more clear about what the public benefits of conservation really are. Two projects that, that have been very much in our focus, uh, one is the Fleetwood Farm, which is privately owned piece uh, along Route 17 in Fauquier County. Uh, it's 2,600 acres and we're desperately trying to figure out how to make that a conservation outcome. Um, another example is the Madden Farm, which is actually in, in, in Culpeper County, um, but is a, a very important example of conservation of land owned by uh, Black American families. Uh, this happens to be a family that was emancipated before the Civil War. It's still in the ownership of the same family, and we're working with the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, in the Culpeper Soil and Water Conservation District to try to get a conservation easement in place either this year or early next year. Um, it will be a very significant and symbolic uh, moment because it will only be the second uh, farm in America protected under the Farm Bill owned by an African-American family. So we're, we feel, feel like that will be an uh, enormously important moment. We're also doing work in a much smaller scale. Uh, one example uh, in, is down in Gordonsville where we're helping with local park structure. We're doing similar work in Fauquier and have over the years. Uh, Julie will talk a little bit about the progress towards the completion of this uh, park at Rappahannock Station that we've been involved with over, over a decade. We're finally getting the point of trail design and that's really exciting to know that it'll soon be open to the public. Um, Bottom line, um, you know, this is a beautiful place and we are lucky to live here and we're lucky to work here. And we are so uh, excited about, about the fact that it's a place that we can increasingly share with the roughly five to six million people that live within 90 minutes. Uh, places like Sky Meadow Park and the Piedmont Memorial Overlook, uh, Roundabout Meadows, which is on Route 50, uh, parks in, in Fauquier County are increasingly seen as a very, very important place to get outdoors. And uh, we've seen visitation increase dramatically. Um, people come hike up to the Piedmont Overlook, um, which is in, in Ashby Gap. And from there, they can see the work of the thousands of families that have, have been part of conservation over the last 50 years. Uh, it's an incredible view. It's a, it's a great place to reflect and, and contemplate. And we are so excited by the, the uh, in, increase in utilization and people's enjoyment of that. We, the kiosk that we set up hopefully teaches them a little bit about how that's happened and about the important role of the community in supporting conservation that protects that view shed. Um, Fleetwood Farm would be a part of a larger uh, conservation effort in that, in that beautiful valley and extend uh, protections to another 2,600 acres. Mike Kane will talk a little bit more about that. It's a big, big, big project, but uh, one where we're making a priority to try to get done in the next couple of years. I wanna close by just uh, giving, a, giving a recognition that the other big issue that's out there is the issue of climate change and how we're gonna respond. PEC has been very, very, determined advocate for distributed solar over the last decade and have worked with the Local Energy Alliance program in Charlottesville to, to try to help landowners, homeowners uh, move forward with their own source of energy, taking advantage of uh, what, what programs are available and some advantage from uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a discount in pricing. We're gonna have an, an uh, an update on that program next week, and I hope you'll join and consider including uh, solar on your house or your farm, because at the end of the day, it's a, a great example of the things that, that we can do uh, to make a difference. PEC added solar to our uh, office when we were, were able to build an addition in 2013, 
and it's made a huge difference. We're able to, to run our, our lighting and uh, information systems, but also to power uh, our, our geothermal system um, and significantly reduce our costs, but also the load that we put on the, on the electrical grid. Everybody does their part. It's a big part of the solution and an example of the kind of uh, direct small scale um, inclusionary measures that we support uh, to try to uh, meet the challenges of the 21st century. So uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of today's session. I'm so glad that you're, you're participating and, and thank you for your support of PEC and of the programs that we work on. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mike King. Hey, um, I'm I'm Julie Boltow. Oh, Joel. Sorry, I'm sorry, Julie. <laughs> Not Mike Kane. I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, <laughs> I am so glad to see you guys, even if it is just virtually. I you know I've been working from home, so I feel very disconnected from many of the the great citizens that you know are always being engaged in um, working on these projects with me. So I'm really glad to be able to give you this presentation. So I'm gonna be talking about land use in Fauquier and give you a quick update on, of what we've been working on. Before I get started, I just wanna make sure, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Awesome, great. So the status of local land use decisions um, is that all our towns and county governments are now open and making regular land use decisions under uh, emergency ordinances adopted in response to COVID-19 pandemic. However, you're not gonna see meetings like that um, held um, anymore. Local work sessions and meetings remain closed to the public. Most are live streamed, but the audio and visual can be poor, making it sometimes difficult to follow. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. Residents may submit comments on issues in writing and attend public hearings in person. Um, one at a time, of course, wearing a mask. And in some cases, they may speak at public hearings virtually. Protocols for virtual participation can be difficult to follow, though, requiring additional preparation, like checking for a sound test an hour before the meeting, or requ uh, requiring additional equipment like headphones or a mic. Internet availability also can hinder remote participation. And under emergency ordinances, Localities are able to exempt themselves from state mandates such as FOIA law, meaning that they can relax stringent timelines if the pandemic prevents them from meeting them. This is an example from Albemarle. Now, just to be clear, Albemarle has not abused this um, ability yet. They generally have been responding pretty quickly, but they have put on their books that you know, they have indefinite time period to respond. So what does this mean in terms of advocacy? It means that government transparency is in a difficult place right now. We need to pay close attention to what's going on. Recognizing this, Fauquier County has refrained from moving forward on new land use issues, but as the pandemic draws on, some decisions will need to move forward. The world just can't stop. Luckily, the county has an online land development tracker tool available to the public. All meetings are live streamed and the county staff has always been and remains very responsive. So if you have problems, always feel free to reach out to them. The towns in, in Fauquier have less resources though and much less staff. Some of them don't even have a single uh, planning staff person and part-time zoning administrators. The county um, is, is better able to maintain that level of transparencies, but the towns are, are doing their best. At the county level, one of the issues we are following is the disposal of film material in rural areas. Uh, we are aware that many in the county, especially residents in the southern end, have been impacted by dumping of excavated film material in rural areas. The county staff are in the process of redrafting the county ordinance, which we are following very closely. Last year, we worked to get some legislation passed at the state level that requires agencies and developers to contact local governments when excavated fill will be dumped in their jurisdiction, and we're hoping that this helps somewhat. We also um, helped to get a second bill passed that requires a working group to be formed at the state level to discuss and identify possible solutions to this statewide problem. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has slowed this process, um, but we're hoping to see progress soon. Also at the southern end of the county, many landowners have been contacted by companies interested in leasing their land for utility scale solar projects. 
We're very supportive of solar energy. As, as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, we have the Solarize uh, Piedmont program, especially distributed solar on rooftops. Some utility scale solar projects done well in the right places can be good though. This image is actually a small utility scale solar site in Remington that covers 125 acres and produces 20 megawatts. These sites though can cover hundreds, even thousands of acres. Forest land is sometimes cut down or prime agricultural land can be taken out of production to accommodate creating significant impacts on agricultural and natural resources. So this is um, a, an article uh, about the project over in Spotsylvania County. You can see most of, I, I, if I, my memory serves me correctly, this site was forested. So this was uh, cut down prior to the solar project being done. And you can see it's having a drastic impact on the landscape. And I believe it's thousands of acres. I can't remember the exact acreage. 6,300. 6,300. The county is drafting a utility scale solar ordinance to address the potential impacts associated with these projects. The Planning Commission recommended approval of that draft ordinance in February. The board plans to hold a work session to discuss this new ordinance on August 13th. Um, the, version, the, uh, we, the version recommended for approval by the Planning Commission was good, but we feel that there's some opportunity for improvement, so we're excited to see this newest version. They will likely hold a public hearing on it uh, on September 10th and possibly vote that evening. The biggest land use issue we are currently following though is the update of the Warrington Comprehensive Plan. Although this plan update has been in the works for some time, the release of the draft plan on June 15th was the first time the details were shared with the public. After reviewing the 513 page document, we had significant concerns and many questions about how this plan would impact existing residents. The goal of the plan is to grow, which is neither surprising or worrisome for the town of Warrington as it is the county seat and we want it to grow. However, what is concerning is what, how, and where the town wants to grow. The focus of the plan is on growth of residential described as a range of housing types in the plan it encourages this growth by allowing by right mixed use in almost all the areas currently zoned commercial and industrial, which is the red on this map. The planned by right mixed use zoning districts are all allow a range of residential types. So on this map, those by right mixed use zoning districts are colored in brown um, from light tan on, on the Greenway and, and um, Makers District to dark brown for the new town character district at the, um, at the top. The plan assumes about 5,000 new residents over the next 20 years will locate in these areas. However, the new zoning districts are planned to not include density caps. So really this is just a rough estimate. We don't honestly know how many residential units will be allowed in these areas. The draft plan also carries forward the idea of the Western bypass around the town from earlier plans. The plan describes the road as a low speed two lane limited access road that would connect Route 17 and Route uh, to Route 20, sorry, Route 17 to Route 211 and then continue all the way down to Route 29. The Southern portion is called the Southern Parkway and the plan states that land would be acquired for a bike and pedestrian trail initially, but this would be converted to a roadway when the additional capacity becomes necessary. We feel the Southern Parkway is especially egregious because it would have to cross through existing easements, neighborhoods, and historical and natural resources. This map shows a rough sketch of the parkway that I placed on top of um, the resources that it would potentially impact um, as it linked up to Route 29. The plan states that it could link up to Route 29 south of the interchange closer to Lover's Lane though. Due to limited time, I'm not gonna go into all of our concerns about the plan, but the last one I'll mention is the lack of information about needed water and sewer upgrades. The plan states that average water demand can be met assuming 5,000 new residents. However, peak water demand will be over the current capacity of the reservoir and wells. This graph shows that assuming a static growth rate, there could be days that peak water usage will be over safe yield as early as 2025, with overages becoming more frequent as population increases. The town included their, 
in their list of future projects a reservoir expansion as a placeholder, but a reservoir expansion would be very expensive and a very daunting task requiring additional land and state and federal permitting. The Planning Commission is scheduled to meet on August 18th and could make a recommendation to the Town Council that night. Depending on if the Planning Commission makes that recommendation or decides to postpone, um, the Town Council could vote on the plans as early as September 8th. So as you can see, there are several web pages um, that you can uh, visit to uh, follow local land use issues in Fauquier. Public hearings are advertised in the local newspaper two weeks prior to the hearing, so it's always a good idea to check the classifieds of the paper. And the town and county websites have lots of information, including meeting agendas, links to live streaming, and links to live streaming meetings. And for those who want to really dive deep, the county has online tools for tracking development proposals and accessing staff reports and other application documents. And don't forget to look at our quarterly newsletter, which includes county updates in the on the ground section. So in summary, um, just go over it real quick. The disposal of fill on rural lands is ongoing. We don't have set dates for when that's gonna be coming forward. Um, utility scale solar on rural lands will be coming before the Board of Supervisors on August 13th for a work session, not for a public hearing. The public hearing um, would potentially be um, September 10th. And actually, I'm sorry, I put BOS. I think that's actually, um, it would be going before the Planning Commission um, September 10th. And then the Warrington Conference Plan Update uh, could be coming or could be voted on by the Planning Commission as early as August 18th and then by the Town Council August or September 8th. So with that, I just want to remind you again, stay informed, stay engaged. Um, this is a difficult environment that we're working in, but things are happening. And if we're not paying attention, Fauquier County could drastically change. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mike Kane. Mike, you there? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I'm just sharing my screen. Looks good, Mike. Hey, everyone. Yep. Okay, great. I'm just and uh, kind of move some move you around on my screen, everyone else. Um, so. It's great to be here, everybody. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Kane. I'm director of conservation at PEC. I've been at PEC for I can't believe about 15 years, um, working on a whole bunch of different land conservation projects over the years. Um, what I wanted to do today is just touch on, you know, hey, what's happening with land conservation in Fauquier? Also, kind of take a look at um, one of the restoration projects that we've been working on that you may not be familiar with. Talk about some of the public access projects that are happening in the county, largely by um, Fauquier County Parks, which is great news. And then um, finally finish up with some of our partnership work that support all of those activities. So, you know, I would just start off as a reminder to everyone of, uh, that Fauquier County is really a model in Virginia for land conservation, ranks number one in the Commonwealth in private lands conserved for public benefit. And just stepping back for a second to what Chris was mentioning about the public benefits of private land conservation, you know, in terms of promoting clean water, protecting farmland for future, um, future agriculture, preservation of the rural landscape, its history, its scenic characteristics, all those pieces when private landowners come together, make the decision to conserve this land, it serves everyone. And I hope everyone keeps that in mind as we, as we proceed through some discussion probably of the land preservation tax credit in the coming months. And the upshot of all that is right now over 108,000 acres are conserved by conservation easement in Fauquier, covering over 26% of the county's land area. So there's, there's been great momentum over the years for land conservation um, in Fauquier. We spend at the beginning of each year say, how are we gonna, how are we gonna reach new landowners 
and talk to them about the, the benefits of conservation. Well, in March, things obviously um, changed and we needed to change how we were working. And so um, how we were gonna keep the momentum in terms of our outreach work. And surprisingly, um, the, the first thing I'd say is that there's still been really strong interest from landowners for land conservation. I think that there's a number of landowners that probably um, had had a, you know, a flyer or something about conservation easements sitting on their desk for maybe weeks or months or years and they cleaned their desk and they said, I gotta get back to PEC about this conservation easement. So we've really had a tremendous response um, and we're busier than ever in terms of working with landowners. But in terms of specific programmatic activities, how we've adjusted some is one, we've gone to webinars like today to do, you know, um, um, uh, educational pieces on easements and other conservation tools. We've done mailings, use snail mail. We've mailed out a mailing to 5,500 landowners in our region about the benefits of conservation. We are still doing our bread and butter work of meeting with property owners, landowners on site. Um, we're practicing, you know, social distancing practices, but we, uh, we have, we have resumed that activity. And then finally, in response to the, the interest that our partners are seeing in land conservation, we are working with them. And, and in this case, it's Fauquier County on a number of easement donations that we hope will happen this year. And just to highlight some of our, one of the uh, webinars that we did in conjunction with the Fauquier County PDR program earlier this year, one of the benefits of going to webinars is anyone can go back and look at it now. We'll send out a link to this after. It was a great presentation by Claire Catlett and supported by Maggie Blumstone. So, you know, we have a great conservation ethic in Fauquier. It's a testament to landowners, the success that we've had. The other part of it is we at PEC need to make sure there's a great set of tools or what we would say the, the, the legs of conservation funding. And we sort of look at it in four, four legs. One is state and local PDR programs. Fauquier is a leader in um, local PDR programs. We have some federal tax incentives associated with conservation easement donations. We try and make use of federal and state programs in particular, um, funding available through the uh, Farm Bill the, um, and NRCS. Um, but the fourth leg of that stool of fun for, for funding is the land preservation tax credit. That's sort of the big one over the last 20 years that has really fueled land conservation in our region, in Virginia, and, and in particular in Fauquier County. About half of all the land conserved in, in Fauquier, over 60,000 acres, are in some ways tied to the use of the tax credit. So as I coming up, I really encourage you to weigh in, um, knowing that it's really an important tool for us for land conservation in Fauquier. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about one, a couple of our restoration or one restoration project in particular that you may not be aware of. You know, we do all kinds of different land and water stewardship practices, working with private landowners, doing stewardship of our own lands that we operate and manage. Um, but there's one that you may not have heard too much about, and that's um, related to some work we've been doing with John Marshall Soil and Water Conservation District. As many of you know, working with landowners to undertake agricultural best management practices are one of the most effective tools um, that we all can under, undertake as landowners to prevent runoff uh, and restore local streams, water quality and local streams in the, in the Chesapeake Bay um, by using cattle exclusion fencing and providing clean water, new sources of clean water to livestock. We can improve both ag production and also um, restore water quality. So uh, we work a lot with John Marshall on these types of projects, but a couple, about two years ago, we said, look, we're willing to step up and help more, um, help you connect with more landowners, help find some additional funding to help landowners take up these practices. They said, and we said, what can we do? And they said, well, the biggest problem that we actually have is we have plenty of people that um, are signing up, but these programs are reimbursements. 
John Marshall provides, will, will provide the technical assistance. They'll even provide funding through the state, which we work to expand down in, down in Richmond. Um, but for those that sign up as a reimbursement program, they simply don't have the upfront money to implement those practices. Many of these projects, which involve fencing, drilling wells, um, installing watering systems, putting in hardened crossings, um, they can be fifty, a hundred thousand dollars. People don't have that funding sitting around. So there's really a short-term funding issue. They said, is there anything you can do to help us with that? And we said, how can we create a tool that would provide a short-term loan just to cover the difference between the time that John Marshall approves the project to the time they cut the check? Probably less than 120 days in most instances. And we worked with the Land Trust Alliance and the Chesapeake Bay Funders Network to um, help us design a short-term revolving loan program using some of our conservation funds, in particular our Goose Creek Conservation Fund and, um, and our Julian Shear Fauquier Land Conservation Fund. So last year we did our first pilot project with this. We worked with the Elgin family up on Bull Run Mountain Road. Many of you know the folks um, at Mountain Hollow, Dean and Carino. Um, they had a big project, it was gonna be over $100,000. We were able to secure or work with them and our Goose Creek Fund, our advisory committee there, to um, provide a short-term loan that helped them install over um, seven or uh, 8,000 feet of fencing and protected um, about 4,100 feet of, of Hungry Run. And we featured them in our, in our mailer this year, as well as there's a nice piece in Middleburg Life as well about this project. It was just, you know, this was sort of one of those projects where just a, a little bit of out of the box thinking on the part of our, of our Conservation Fund Advisory Committee members on the part of John Marshall and then the landowner. And of course, our board here at PEC is helping to make improvements that can accelerate the pace of um, water quality improvements, something that we really need to see happen in our area. Since then, we've undertaken another project down in Southern Fauquier um, with the assistance of our Julian Shear Fauquier Land Conservation Fund. And now we're on our way to our third project, which at the Clifton Institute, um, and these really, all these projects provide multiple benefits in terms of providing clean water to livestock, protecting additional lands, repairing buffers. And in the case, in the case of Clifton, there's uh, a, a big partnership doing a large um, pasture grazing demo project. So our participation with that and our assistance with this is really gonna help lots of people see um, in Fauquier uh, the benefits of, uh, implementing agricultural BMP projects. Again, we're doing a number of restoration projects. Here's one I thought maybe you're not hearing of, but wanted to share today. Just wanna talk a little bit as well about some, Chris mentioned the importance of open space in particular um, and public access at this particular moment. You know, the changes in COVID or the, the um, have, brought so much interest in people wanting to get out. And I've been up to the, our overlook at Paris any number of times since March. It's amazing the number of people that are up there each and every day. If you're there on a Saturday or Sunday, the crowds are uh, almost, you know, almost overwhelming. We know that we need to be able to um, provide places where people can experience not only specific sites, but if you look out on this photo right here, you're looking out on 100,000 acres of land conserved by conservation easement. Looking out over to the Bull Run Mountains and to provide those opportunities is of course very important at this time. So uh, in addition to our work at or, uh, uh, our public access at the Overlook, you know, we've been thinking how do, you, how do we really expand upon those opportunities? And Chris mentioned Fleetwood Farm. Many of you may know that Fleetwood Farm is about 2,600 acres. It is currently on the market. It is one of the largest unconserved properties in our region. And its location near the, 
uh, Thompson Wildlife Management Area, Sky Meadows, our own Piedmont Overlook, really provides a microcosm of the Piedmont region and has numerous resources, both historic, natural, agricultural. And so we're looking at a number of options to see if there's an opportunity to conserve this landscape. It's not just our region that would hold Fleetwood to be a really important conservation priority, but also the work along, it's within the viewshed of the Appalachian Trail, National Scenic, Scenic Trail. We at PEC are part of a large landscape uh, consortium looking at the, how to preserve the AT into the next, for the next hundred years. And we've worked and identified a half dozen places along the AT that are really threatened at this point, stretching from Maine to Georgia. And this stretch between Harper's Ferry to um, down to Front Royal, which includes this area here and Paris, was identified as one of the most threatened, in part because of its proximity to Washington and also because of how narrow the trail is at this particular moment. Preservation of Fleetwood would be a big step forward and a big win in this overall effort to conserve um, the view shed. Not that the AT would be going through a future Fleetwood, but preserving the experience of the AT. And out of that experience um, and out of that recognition of the threat created, or uh, looking at the long term future of the AT, is uh, we're a founding member of the Blue Ridge Conservation Alliance, working with all these organizations. You can here from Virginia Working Landscapes to Friends of the Blue Ridge, Land Trust of Virginia, and others um, to see how we can expand and accelerate conservation along the Blue Ridge. Of course, our, our public access work is not just limited to along uh, the Blue Ridge down in Southern Falk here. Uh, we, I would first give a number of props to the uh, McDonald family and uh, Fauquier County Parks and Rec for last year opening up the Riverside Preserve, which is the first public access point in Fauquier to the Rappahannock River. <clears throat> and second, also looking going down, down river to, um, to Remington. I know that the county is working on final plans for uh, the opening of Rappahannock Station, which is a longtime partnership with PEC and the Department of Historic Resources. We look forward to seeing that happen. That site will not have a, a, a boat launch on it, but as many of you know, Fauquier County is also looking at the Rector track just on the other side of the road um, that would provide a, a public access point to the Rappahannock. So now we're starting to see some additional access points and that, to the Rappahannock. That's really important at this particular moment because there are very few, very few places. What we have been doing is working with, again, Fauquier County and many of our partners, including John Marshall again, friends of the Rappahannock, um, to identify and hopefully open places where we can expand public access along, along not only the Rappahannock, but also the Rapidan River looking beyond Fauquier County. And this effort to look at uh, public access points really builds on a larger uh, conservation initiative that PEC has been spearheading over the last couple of years. And that is the Rappahannock Rapidan Conservation Initiative and the partnership that goes with it. I just first have to give a shout out. This is really, uh, this effort is really being driven by a very generous grant from the Volgenau Foundation to really focus on the preservation of some of the best farmland in, uh, in Virginia with great cultural and natural um, resources and landscapes. And so we have brought together as, as part of our conservation effort in the Upper Rappahannock, which includes uh, Fauquier, Culpeper, Parts of Orange, Madison, Rappahannock and, um, and a little bit of Green County um, to really uh, bring a lot of energy and momentum to this conservation opportunity. We've created a, a partnership of um, many of our, our 
strong advocates and allies along the way. Um, and the real focus of this is to leverage some, some of the funding from the funding from the Volgenau is to, to get additional funding for particularly farmland preservation, public access, water quality improvements uh, in the Rapidan, Rappahannock watershed, upper Rappahannock watershed. So. With that, I just want a quick summary. You know, we're really sustaining momentum for land conservation. Uh, private landowners providing public benefits. We're continuing our outreach. We need to make sure um, that we maintain those robust incentives for conservation. You know, we're doing lots of things for um, restoration and stewardship of the resources in the area and looking at you know, creative ways to try and make those things happen. We wanna expand opportunities um, for people to experience the Piedmont. And finally, and you know, really most importantly, the power of partnerships, whether it's working with landowners or all the partners I just mentioned on the previous slide, um, or uh, funders that help make these things happen. Nothing happens in a vacuum. We can't do it alone. We really appreciate all the support and, uh, and sense of, of um, shared mission with all of our partners, so. Last thing I just want to say is all the things I just mentioned are happening um, with these three conservation leaders in, in Fauquier, Claire Catledge really leading our work with uh, Julian Shear, um, Fauquier Land Conservation Fund. Maggie's leading our um, Rappahannock Conservation Initiative. Tracy's really working on the Blue Ridge Conservation Alliance. I just wanted to show them. So if you have questions or you want to follow up afterwards, these are the people that know it all and that you should really be in touch with. So with that, um, and following on our, our push to preserve some of the best farmland in, um, in our Piedmont region in Virginia, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. To talk a little bit about local food. Matt? Thank you, Mike. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Hi everyone, uh, Matt Coyle. I'm the local food systems coordinator for PEC and I'm uh, relatively new here. I uh, came on board in March of this year. Uh, I think we have about uh, three minutes left. So I'm gonna try to make this short and sweet for you guys. But if you have any questions, uh, please ask them at the end or, or send me an email directly. Uh, since 2006, as many of you know, PEC has been the Buy Fresh Buy Local leader in the Commonwealth, and we're working to promote farms through this program. Um, we have been sending out print guides every year. As of this year, we're going to um, extend those print guides to a two-year term. So uh, the print guide from last year is still good through the end of 2020, and we'll send out another one in 2021 that will go through 2022. So in this off year, we've uh, designed and relaunched a new website. It is uh, by local uh, piedmont.org and you can go to it to see an interactive map uh, where you can easily find local food, uh, local farmers markets and farms and enter your zip code and select a radius and uh, it'll populate this map with with farms in your area. Um, it's, a, it's a neat tool to use uh, for folks who uh, want to find local food in their community but also for our farmers. Uh, they can create a profile uh, put their contact information on there and their website and about us and, and link their social media accounts as well as actually sell online uh, through this market maker uh, software program that we've partnered with. Um, so it's really innovative and, and since the pandemic, um, online sales for local farms have just taken off. So we're trying to do our part to ensure that our local farmers have just another outlet to sell their products. Um, that's more of a long-term goal. In the short term, uh, we have been raising money to um, purchase milk from local dairy farms uh, right here in Fauquier County and across the region and donating them to food banks. Uh, we started with um, Fauquier Community Food Bank in Warrington and with help of the PATH Foundation and a $5,000 grant from them and um, private donors uh, like you all. Uh, so thank you for that. We've been able to raise almost $60,000 for this initiative um, and donate to the Fauquier Community Food Bank. Um, 
uh, Community Touch in Bealton, Fauquier Fish, uh, and we've donated over 2,000 gallons since, since the end of May when we started this to uh, food pantries in Fauquier County and over 8,000 gallons um, in our nine county region. Um, we are serving 23 food pantries across nine counties right now and donating over 1,600 gallons of fresh milk every single week. So thank you to our supporters who helped us make that happen. Uh, dairy farmers have been struggling uh, more than any other farm since the pandemic started. 30 to 40% of their sales were going to the school system. And now with uh, schools closed um, can, and continue to be closed, uh, with Fauquier uh, going to the virtual classroom this fall, those sales will continue to be down. So we hope to extend this initiative at least through the end of the year. Um, and you can see on this map that most of these dairy farms actually fall in Fauquier County. And it's, uh, it's not a long-term solution by any means, but it is something that we can do right now to help our local dairy farmers and those most vulnerable um, in our community who rely on the food bank to feed their families. And um, we see that demand increasing as well. Um, we have uh, also started a beef initiative and a pilot program with Lakota Ranch in Remington and the Fauquier Community Food Bank. We've raised some funds to uh, supply them with 400 pounds of, of locally grown all grass fed ground beef um, a month. And we hope to continue that through the end of the year. Um, this, this has also shown us how the pandemic and our national food system has just um, fallen apart through the pandemic. And, and food processing for our animal farmers has become uh, another issue that we need to address. So we've partnered with the American Farmland Trust to study the feasibility of bringing a centrally located animal processing facility to the region um, to help ease the uh, demand um, on these local processors by our local animal farmers. Um, currently, our local animal farmers are waiting over a year to get a slot and to be able to get their animals in to be processed so they can bring that to market. Um, so this is a, a long-term solution that we continue to work on. And uh, like I said, in partnership with the American Farmland Trust and we'll continue these efforts to support our local farming community uh, any way that we can. Um, and I think with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Marco and we'll take some questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt.